Thank you all for joining. Today we have a, another webinar in our Lessons from the Field series. And we have Robin from Alive and Kickin'. Robin is the mom and entrepreneur and also founder or co-founder and executive director of Alive and Kickin'. I will turn it over to her to have a little bit of an introduction, introduce herself and uh, go ahead with her presentation on what they have done, the, her organization with her registry, with their registry and how it's going. Thank you, Robin. Go well, ahead. thank you, go. Wilma. Um, I am Robin Dubin. I am co-founder and executive director of Alive and Kickin'. We are a patient advocacy organization focused on um, the Lynch syndrome patient community. Uh, this is a hereditary cancer patient community. I'll go through it a little bit. Uh, it was founded by my husband and myself. He is a three-time cancer survivor and a, has a Lynch syndrome um, genetic mutation. Uh, one out of two of our kids that have been tested so far carry the gene mutation. And um, we still have one more child to get tested shortly when he turns 18. Um, so I will go through a little bit about Lynch syndrome, what our foundation does, how we developed our registry, and how it has enabled us to connect and work with research. So uh, our mission is to improve the lives of individuals and families affected by Lynch syndrome and associated cancers through research, education, and screening. Um, the, if you, all right, my page down, here we go, okay. Um, so Lynch syndrome is a genetic condition. It increases a person's risk for certain types of cancers. Uh, it is a gene, there are five genes that make up Lynch syndrome. They are all mismatch repair genes, uh, which means that the, um, in their, D in your DNA, your body doesn't have the capability to actually repair cell errors. Those cell errors turn into tumors. It puts you at high risk for certain types of cancers, primarily colon and endometrial cancer, but, uh, different varying degrees of ri higher risk for almost everything in the GI urological and reproductive tracts. Um, so patients that know they have a Lynch mutation need to have a wide variety of um, cancer screening starting at very early age. It is actually extremely common. Um, the most recent studies indicate one in 279 individuals has a Lynch mutation. Over 95% of them don't know they have it. That means up to 1.2 million Americans um, have, have this uh, genetic mutation, uh, and yet uh, most of them don't know they have it and are not getting screened. Uh, it is an autosomal dominant mutation. You have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it from one parent. Um, knowing your family history of cancer is really the first and most important step in getting diagnosed earlier before a cancer diagnosis. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the research landscape because this is a common condition and many, I think, of the organizations that work with the Genetic Alliance actually focus on rare conditions we have a kind of a different research landscape because there are many different researchers around the country and around the world that are doing research related to Lynch syndrome and hereditary cancer. Um, there are two main um, medical societies that focus on inherited GI cancers. One is the Collaborative Group of the Americas. The other is Insight, it's, it's, it's an international society. Um, in the Collaborative Group of the Americas, it, it's primarily the U.S., but it's also South America and Central America, and uh, we're actively involved in that. My husband actually is on the Membership and Communications Committee now, so um, we work very closely with a lot of the physicians and scientists that are part of uh, the Collaborative Group of the Americas, and they make up uh, a large part of uh, the professionals that focus on Lynch syndrome at the major cancer centers around the US. 
Um, this is very different from a rare condition where you may have very few researchers working on your condition and uh, you have to work in a different way to engage those researchers to work with your patients community and, and your organization. Um, so I think that has definitely um, been a factor in how we developed our patient registry and how we utilize it. Um, one of the important things um, that we have kind of taken a look at is where the knowledge gaps are in both the patient and clinical communities. Um, in the patient community, the knowledge gap is primarily those that are undiagnosed in the general public, at least 95% of them. Uh, of, of the individuals that have a Lynch mutation don't know they have it. And, the, and that in, includes um, family members um, and um, large family groups. Um, so one of the things we focus on and as an organization, because we are a small organization with a large patient population is focusing our resources, including our registry on those that already are diagnosed with Lynch. Tackling kind of awareness to the general public is, has been something that we've only done in very small situations or very, you know, specific situations. We focus most of our resources, our time and our financial resources on working with and providing um, providing support, education, and resources like the registry to those that have been diagnosed with Lynch and are trying to manage the condition. In the clinical community, the knowledge gaps um, are primarily in the primary care setting. Um, primary care doctors are not often um, taking a good family history of cancer are not often referring patients or even recognizing in a family history, the need for genetic counseling and genetic testing for this condition. Um, it does happen more in the GI and GYN spaces um, where GI doctors are seen and asking, and GYN doctors are asking history of G GI and GYN cancers and therefore um, when those family histories um, come up that indicate Lynch, they're off, they are referred to genetic counseling and testing more often there. Um, and in oncology, after a, ca a cancer diagnosis in, um, in one individual, often then there will be family history conversations, especially if it's an early onset um, cancer, which happens often in uh, Lynch syndrome. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about our heroic registry. Um, we started working with the Genetic Alliance back in probably 2015 uh, when they first started to be, build out the peer platform. We had already been talking to them about develop, oh, help it, having them help us develop a, um, a patient registry. We felt that um, when we looked around at the research landscape and the clinical landscape, a lot of the patient information and patient data was siloed in academic institutions and, and large cancer centers. Um, and it made it more difficult for research to happen. It made it more difficult for us to pull our patient community together and have them be more engaged in the research that's happening. And so we felt that a patient registry would be an important resource um, to provide to our community. And so we started talking to them. We were one of the first 15 organizations that was um, part of the original grant when they first built out and developed the peer platform. And so we were one of the first ones to launch a registry on the peer platform. Um, we worked, it was a really time consuming to put it together, but we had a really strong, um, I have a really strong medical advisory board of Lynch syndrome professionals who have done a lot of work on um, 
developing registries in their academic institutions and they were you know invaluable in helping me put together the survey instruments and what kind of information we it was important to collect for um, our patient community and so that's how we started by building out our registry um, as you can see um, this is as of essentially just before we transitioned our registry from the peer platform over to Luna Peer. But some of the data we collect, we primarily, we have two or three main um, survey instruments on data that we collect. Um, and they are uh, a personal um, diagnosis survey instrument a family history survey instrument and a screening survey. Um, so in this, for example, is what some of the data that's collected in the personal history. So you can see uh, all the, the large variety of um, cancers that patients have had. Some of the other data we collect, we collect has indicated you know, multiple cancers for many of our patients. Um, our data shows early onset um, and low, you know, average age of diagnosis of cancer is, is much, much lower than in the general public or the average risk individuals for colon and endometrial cancer, things like that. And as you could see a large percentage of our patient um, population that's in our registry, has a Lynch syndrome diagnosis, but has never had cancer. Um, so, you know, we collect, we also collect serve, uh, screening information on what types of annual screenings they do. In fact, uh, one of our recent um, abstracts that we did last year at 20 in 20, that was at ASCO in 2021 kind of outlined, um, looking at what their screening protocols were compared to NCCN guidelines and, and whether patients were getting more um, broad and broader screening or more frequent screening and broader screening than NCCN guidelines or less frequent and less broader screening. So um, it, there's um, interesting ways of working, of looking at the data that we collect. Um, in our original launch of the registry on the peer platform, we developed brochures. We had kind of a patient outreach campaign, um, both um, at, you know, different um, patient facing um, events, whether they were with other advocacy organizations. Um, we partner with a lot of other advocacy organizations, colon cancer awareness organizations and things like that um, to kind of outreach to the general public and to the Lynch patient community and the cancer patient community about our registry um, and, and some social media outreach as well. In terms of research to uh, outreach to the research community, We've worked very hard by um, on attending a lot of medical conferences, developing abstracts and submitting them and having posters at medical conferences. At least pre-COVID, we attended obviously CGA and the Inherited GI Cancer Conferences. Uh, we uh, attend NSGC, the National Society of Genetic Counselors. We attend ASCO, clinical oncology conferences. Um, and we worked really hard. There was um, definitely, uh, when we first started approaching the research community about our registry, when it was first launched, um, there was quite a bit of uncertainty or skepticism almost about you know, the value of it. Uh, as we grew our registry, the more patients that we have brought on to the registry, the more abstracts and posters that we've had at conferences, and the more we've been invited to speak at both patient conferences and medical conferences, we, we have developed a um, 
interaction with the research community where they have really started to recognize the value of the work we do in the patient community and our connection to patients and, and what that can mean for their research. So it has taken quite a bit of time, but we have really worked hard on changing their minds about the value of engaging patients in research and utilizing the patient advocacy community to do that. Uh, we relaunched uh, back in, I guess it was the very beginning of April of 2021 on the new Luna Peer Registry. This was our dashboard for last week. Um, we started off primarily by social media outreach in this day and age. We aren't yet still having a whole lot of in-person interaction. Um, but so we have, since the relaunch in April, we have been really focusing on our social media outreach and I'm going to dive into that a little bit more. Um, in um, on the next slide, but you can see little upticks in our um, registered users and things like that. Um, a lot of that corresponds with very specific campaigns on outreach um, on social media. So I will show you what we did. As a small organization, with very limited resources and only one employee. I am the only employee of the organization. I had to, uh, I don't have like a social media manager that handles this stuff full time. I do this all on my own. So I found, uh, I tried to figure out what the most appropriate social media tools were. Um, and I stumbled upon later.com, which is similar to other, um, kind of social media platforms that allow you to schedule posts and put posts up on a variety of different social media outlets, primarily Instagram. So it allows you to schedule in advance Instagram posts, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter. And uh, it, it's a pretty nominal fee for what you're allowed, what you're able to do on there. Um, the other tool that I use often is Ripple. And let me see if I can play this because it Ripple allows you to take um, graphics and um, individual um, graphics and kind of turn them into a video. And I'm not like a social media expert, but I know that video content on social media often gets more views and based on algorithms than um, just static photos or graphics. So I try to turn as many of our um, graphics into a uh, video format using Ripple. And so for example, this is what we did. Um, and that's, that's really all it does. And this is a, a little video that I was able to put together with just one graphic on Ripple, and then I upload it to later, and I can schedule um, the um, posts on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn to do it. And when I have a concerted effort on social media outreach and scheduling posts specifically about the registry, that's when we really start to see upticks in um, the number of users on the registry. And I just try to keep going back to it as often as I can. Um, we had a few big events recently, so I haven't put out as much social media on um, the registry itself, but I need to go back to kind of my regular rotation of social media outreach, which includes the registry and some of our other programming as well. Um, and then let me try and switch pages. Um, okay, here we go. So what has been the impact? Um, since we launched the registry, um, or since a, a little while after we launched the registry, where we really got to a critical mass of several hundred patients in our registry, we have started having, there has been definitely a change in our research engagement and collaborations. 
we haven't yet had any researchers come to us and dig right into the um, peer, the Luna peer and say, I want to do research on the platform, but it has made a big difference in approaching us. Um, we used to get them approach us say, oh, hey, I've got this study I'm doing. Can you put it out there on your social media and try and help us engage patients? And um, we would do that a little bit. We started getting to the point where they would, where researchers would come to us before they've actually applied for a grant. And they would ask us for letters of support for the grant. Um, and then we kind of started going step further and saying, you know, we can help you with recruitment. We can help you with enrolling patients into your, into your studies if the, you have it in your grant budget to support us financially for us to do that work. And that's really changed things. So we now have researchers coming to us and saying, I'm working on this study. I want you to be on our advisory board. Um, we are, we're putting in the grant application. What, we need a letter of support, but we will also like to have you help engage patients, bring patients into our study, and they actually budget into the grant budget for recruitment for the work that we are doing on their behalf. So having the registry and as a, a kind of a validating tool of what we are capable of doing in our um, patient community and how we can work with researchers has made a big difference in how they engage with us. Um, so, you know, we also, also do other work in terms of um, our resources. We launched for the first time in 2019 a patient workshop. We bring a very small group of patients in to um, a major cancer center partnering with the Colon Cancer Coalition. Um, we do patient education, bringing in researchers and clinicians to speak to our patients. We do advocacy training and we do um, uh, content creation. We videotape all our patient stories, the dozen or so patients that we bring in. It's actually an application process and they get selected to join us. We just did it in September um, at the Ohio State um, Cancer Center with a dozen patients in Columbus. And we actually, um, that was where we um, had our PCORI engagement award where we worked with the Lynch Syndrome Screening Network to do patient stakeholder focus groups at our Columbus uh, patient workshop. And we are going to be doing professional stakeholder in focus groups um, at the Collaborative Group of the Americas. Um, so that is our primary um, work that we do related to the registry and how we've grown it. 